and we look forward to another exciting uh, panel again that is on uh, the importance of research in global technology firms and we have with us uh, harsh jagadeesan who is the chief solutions officer and member of executive board at springer nature he's a technology man and i think this topic is very close to his heart because he thinks technology as a problem solver so uh, thank you for the quick uh, introduction alpana welcome everybody i hope you're having a great time here at our first ever springer nature's um, science and technology symposium very quickly my name is uh, harsh jagadeesan i'm the chief solutions officer for springer nature and responsible for platforms and solutions uh, i'm a technologist myself and a computer scientist um used to work in technology companies i come to you live from uh, heidelberg germany i'm really really excited to moderate this panel on the importance of research in global technology um uh, firms um and as you all know um bits are becoming a very important part of our lives uh, for a long part of our time here on earth as uh, humans um atoms were ruling it all and uh, for the past few years bits have uh, really taken a uh, significant place so technology is becoming a key building block for every single industry whether it's advancing life sciences or healthcare consumer goods transportation energy utilities and everything that we touch is technology enabled so uh technology is becoming like a fabric and research and discovery is sort of really enabling us to build a step change in every single industry and technology is acting as a catalyst today with me i have some really great minds and senior leaders from the technology industry to talk this through um i'd like to welcome uh, my august panel so first of all let me start uh, introducing the panel very quickly before we get ahead uh, i have with me bhavna agarwal who's the country head uh, of strategy and growth for uh, hello packard uh, venkat who's the deputy md of microsoft uh, research uh, lab in india uh, jagdish mitra who's the chief strategy officer and head of growth for tech mahindra and uh, sachin bajaj who's uh, chief of strategy and markets so thank you all for joining us today and um, i'm really excited to get started so let's let's kick it off uh, and let me ask this question to you venkat um from your perspective of uh, leading microsoft research lab in india how do global technology firms today partner with research institutions how do they really partner with research institutions to ensure that Uh, the technologies and innovations that are happening in research get transferred into real sustainable solutions that have impact on people and planet what's your take on that sure yeah uh, you know first of all thanks harsh and uh, the organizers for inviting me it's a pleasure to be here uh, yeah so i think your question is an interesting one it's also a very broad question uh, i'm getting a lot of squeaking squeaking sounds i don't know if are others hearing that as well from other microphones or something i'm getting a lot of background Harsh, are you hearing that as well? Uh, I can. I I also hear the squeaking sound. I wonder whether some people have not muted themselves. Uh, are there people who have not? Uh, I mean, outside of the panel, maybe there are people. But anyway, I can keep going. Uh, so, I would say, uh, you know, speaking from my experience at Microsoft Research uh, globally, I think the, uh, uh, the one of the key enablers for uh, a strong linkage with and collaboration with. Uh, research institutions academia and others is openness right so uh, one of the things that we pride, of our, pride ourselves on in mixer research is that we uh, are very open about what we do we publish and if you, in fact if you look online you'll find that in most sort of conferences and so on you know mixer research or mixer uh, researchers have a huge presence right and uh, and we sort of give talks and so on right so i think that sort of sets up a, a flow of information uh, that's two way right we tell people mm-hmm. what they Working on what's in our mind, and we hear from academia. And then we have various channels and programs by which we can engage with academia, right? Uh, for example, we can host professors as visiting researchers or students as interns. We have these targeted requests for proposals where we uh, put out a call on a very topical problem. For example, I think last year there was something on AI and security, right? And so we ask academics to. uh submit proposals and we you know select some of them and then sort of fund them right so that 
But let me actually talk uh, about a couple of things that we have done here out of MSR India that mm -hmm. you know uh, are somewhat uh, unique. So the work we do you know, globally at MSR, in particular at MSR India, I would say is broadly in two buckets. There is, there is the uh, geo-blind or geo-independent work, which is really technology-centric, could, could happen anywhere in the world. We happen to be doing here, doing it here. And there is work that is inspired by our location here in India, where we have interesting problems at our doorstep that are crying out for solutions, technology-based solutions, and we are able to uh, you know, use research and technology to address them. So in the latter bucket, a couple of examples are, one is uh, affordable healthcare, right? So that is a huge problem. I mean, not just in India, it's a global problem, but certainly in mm -hmm. India, it's a big problem. And so some colleagues of mine worked on uh, the specific problem of tuberculosis and tracking medication adherence for TB patients. And that's a big deal. But people take some medicines and then stop, and then you, know, you, you end up with drug-resistant TB. And so they came up with a system called 99 DOTS, I'm not going to describe it here, but it is a very sort of simple but elegant system that has been scaled to millions of patients globally today. It's not just India now, it's many, many countries. It's been adopted by the government of India. Uh, I think they partnered with the WHO, the Bill Gates Foundation, you know, uh, uh, many, many partners. Uh, another example, which I was uh, sort of instigated of and directly involved in, is around road safety, right? So road safety is again a big problem, India and elsewhere. And uh, Sorry, I, I, yeah. So in the previous one, we partnered with all these things like WHO and so on. In this one, the road safety, we partnered with Triple IT Hyderabad and IIT Bombay, Road Academic Papers, and then we partnered with Maruti Suzuki. I know they are not an academic thing, but you know we partnered with other companies as well, and we rolled out a solution called Hams for automating the driver license test, right? And so there are uh, multiple RTOs across the country where you can take a driver license test with just a smartphone in the car and no, no inspector, right? So that was a result of collaboration between us and our partners in academia, universities, and Amarathi and so on. So these are just examples of things we have done where you know we got together with like-minded people and you know, made things happen in the real world. Venkat, what really comes out of uh, what you just explained to us is uh, three things in terms of openness and you know doing research in the open, the whole collaboration that you talked about with research institutes, academic institutes, with Microsoft Research, and also the outcome of this research into solving concrete problems like, you know, adherence for patients who are suffering from tuber tuberculosis or, uh, you know, solving a particular problem um, about driver's license and so on and so forth. So you sort of beautifully explained how openness, collaboration, and problem solving um, has resulted from this whole um endeavor that you did and i just want to uh, actually open it up a little bit and maybe i want to come to you jagdish from your experience in tech mahendra how do you see this today in terms of collaboration between global technology firms like yours research institutes and how do you see uh, you know translation of all of this discovery into sustainable business solutions do you have some examples that you can share with us Oh, sure. First of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon. Um, as you can tell, I'm taking this call from a car, which is uh, um, just to demonstrate the fact that today are working from home and working from anywhere, I guess, is possible. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that I think bring up a good topic, and Venkat talked about it in terms of what Microsoft Research is doing, um, Tech Mahindra, as you would know, is more a solutions integrator. It brings together solutions together and builds out a business outcome for its customers, um, help them journey towards the digital transformation and so and so and so forth. So research becomes almost an integral part of what we do and multiple partners that we collaborate with. Right now, we're doing a fair amount of work with Microsoft that's in the work that we could do jointly in 5G and sustainability and some of the state of art. Um, network research work that we're doing together. But beyond that, with research institutions, a couple of examples that I would like to show, talk to today about is primarily around the areas of quantum and primarily around the areas of some of the work that we're doing around pharma and life sciences and molecular. So we pick up topics <clears throat> that we see where we bring together our customers' business problems and we see a trend direction or see that's an opportunity marry that with what the technology innovations that are happening or are getting incubated and bring in an academy or research that has done some fundamental work in that area so molecular biology for us was something that we did with the center for 
molecular and molecular biology at uh, CCMB in Hyderabad. We parallelly worked with them in terms of creating an incubator around health and pharma sciences. Quantum, on the other hand, we took it international. We're doing that with Finland, uh, with the Finland government and the work that we do with Finland in bringing that together. So similarly, there are multiple such examples depending on the specialization of the research institute. We pick up certain centers of excellence and then build that with them jointly. And the big part over here is most of the times we have tried to involve a client along with us, a client who's, you know, participating in defining the problem along with us so that we are building something that has a future value in terms of, um, you know, implementation, as well as there is a little bit of appreciation of what the real life problems are and could be. So you're actually researching on something that's for the future, but you're also putting together a business problem that can be applied more practically for a solution which is, say, two to three years down the line. So uh, actually, this was very valuable. And both of you, Venkat and Jagdish, you actually talked about concrete solutions that touch uh, people's lives um, and really underline the fact that uh, research or technology doesn't happen in isolation, but it's basically uh, towards problem solving and solving the big problems that we face. Um, so thank you very much for this perspective. One of the aspects now I want to move ahead and touch about touch upon is basically the the value and impact of um, scientific research that happens across uh, the world, whether it's corporate research or uh, you know institutional research, and what is the impact of that on entrepreneurial ecosystems for science and technology, and also how does it really shape public policy? So that's exactly what I would want to touch upon. And maybe I want to ask you, Sachin, and I know you are facing some difficulties with your camera, uh, but if you can hear us, I would want to you know, pick your brains on how you think about the impact of scientific research on entrepreneurship as well as uh, public policy. Yeah, so no, thanks a lot for the uh, invite, Art, and uh, it's a very good question. When we, when we look at uh, the scientific community as well as uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. These are two very, uh, let me say, important elements of how different groups come together. And it starts, I would say there are three stages to it. One, there is the creation of the idea funnel. Then there is a validation and then there's the monetization aspect. Now, when we look at our work at Markets and Markets with various universities, and then we connect it back to the tech transfer platform to various entrepreneurs, we see that on one side, there is the scientific research community who does a great job of coming up with ideas, but then don't know how to monetize them very well and validate them better in market. And at times, some of the best ideas which are produced by various great research universities, for example, Stanford produced Siri, but sold to Apple for $5 million, uh, which we know today is how valuable. So we see the role of research increasingly becoming not just about creating ideas but also then validating along with entrepreneurs in a joint market model and then slowly taking it out to the broader entrepreneurial ecosystem and without a core backbone of research without the core backbone of the models which are evolving today it's going to be very difficult for entrepreneurial community to get the best of both ones so for me that is in a nutshell what's happening in terms of linkage between these two and talking about Suri, I'm really happy that Suri has gotten better over time and can still understand me and can do a few things that I'm asking uh, Siri to do. So, yeah, absolutely. And uh, I want to come to you, Bhavna, actually with the same question and the same theme specifically around the impact of scientific research uh, on entrepreneurship as well as public policy. And also, if you can have uh, add some examples from the record, that will be really valuable. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me. And I absolutely loved hearing the views of everyone. I think that's very, very relevant. Um, you know, so I think when we really look at uh, this entire funded scientific research, I think it can, uh, harsh, you know, it can have a very good impact if you execute it well. And uh, just of the broader piece is that, you know, if you want to really stay ahead in the industry and make good profits, you need to adapt, right, to your environment. And how do you do that, right? One of the ways is through research. Even though a lot of times people take it as a very broad term, 
but for example you know in the industry for a technology company to be successful i mean there are two key researchers one is a market research another is a technical research if you have a very flexible and an open approach you can actually make it a lot more effective not only for let's say a science scientific based project but also to drive a lot of entrepreneurial policies because that's a more inclusive approach and especially let's say in the entrepreneurial ecosystem we are usually focused on creating newer ventures and india you know has a very rich heritage of developing that kind of a temperament and especially last few years so there are various components there's people capital infra and tech so there's been a lot of discussion of late that you know what really is the impact uh, of research right and these data points in the long term focused initiative and how does it really shape up the entire entrepreneurial ecosystem i and at least i've seen that you know it has had a very positive impact across regions across industries because it actually enables the entire ecosystem to grow sustainably and you're able to respond to a lot of changing market conditions a lot faster in fact at hp you know i'm part of this uh, entire startup program that we launched some time ago which is called as digital catalyst we are actually seeing a lot of these uh, startup ideas which are rooted in a lot of these publicly funded scientific researches and and i think a uh, lot of the great success that we are seeing in the country from the startups is greatly attributed to a lot of policy push from government in recent years a lot of these digital india initiatives which has enabled a lot of these entrepreneurs at hp also you know we working with a lot of these uh, educational temples uh, of the country like iisc iits and several knowledge development agencies you know whether it's around academic research whether in climate semiconductor industry oil and gas automotive etc and we actually you know developing to aid the requirements you know in the public scientific research space for example you know very quick example is some of the cooling technologies used in our compute platforms have developed some amount of innovation that we did for the space so mm-hmm. i think uh, there's a lot of good value that can come out of this if you were to get direct access to the latest available researches mm-hmm. evidences and data and it can actually lead to the overall development of the organization increase its revenue in long run as customer requirements are much better served if if you were to take a holistic view so so that's that's my opinion around that Uh, this is this is really valuable we talked about technology transfer we talked about um how collaboration between scientific institutes and how science scientific research and discovery can have direct impact on entrepreneurship you talked about the role of government and policy in building the right environment uh for some of these collaborations to happen so very very valuable um one of the things that i also want to touch upon is um some of the challenges and barriers that we see today in the transfer of technology we talked about uh, you know technology transfer so what are some of these challenges and barriers uh, in research institutes and how can these barriers be overcome and maybe i want to start this off with you jagdish uh, for your perspective on this i think couple of things that automatically hurts become a big challenge um you know for us as we start to work with research institutes and these are practical experiences that i had we have gone through um india is today a global r and d wise a very low spender so from a perspective of comparison to developed markets we are in a very very small unit of spend that we do and therefore getting the business cases developed and all of us to recognize that there is a little bit bigger mind mind share shift right so everyone recognizes the value of r and d and the value of what we can do to what it can do to business but typically what we see as a challenge in convincing our business units and business owners and also the academy are to be aligned on two things one from the business guys the challenge is to make sure they understand what will be the outcome that they get measured to because it will all go into some sort of investment roi discussion as it starts to become and for the academia that or the research institute that you work with you need to make them understand that at the end of the day you have to make sure there is a business outcome associated with it so this is very very important that you start to see that value coming together and that's a big challenge for practically for every business to overcome 
as we start to build that, there are a few key things that I have seen or we have seen as a company and the industry in India where it has succeeded is a few things that work. One is create low cost indigenous solutions. Okay. And and look at them as starting off as in order to create tailor-made solutions, they become the starting point of the discussion as you start to do it. Then we obviously need to work with a few set of academia where you're building that relationship with the academia and start to build on that and focus on develop. So improve the industry academia through industry body. That's a key directive that I think we as a country need to do because today they are kind of little more divergent and not as explicitly used as it's used in the West. And so therefore there is a there's 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 a lot of work to be done on that. And then that obviously has its big difference on two other areas. Skill gap, according to the World Economic Forum, there is a huge skill gap between the kind of people entering research and development, the kind of people that are needed for the R and D type of work. And that needs to be obviously focused on in terms of how you build a cadre of people on technology people who are focused on doing research and development, because otherwise you'll end up only being people who are being very sort of implementation oriented or mm. tactical in nature, but not focusing on a slightly long term goal. And it needs to be given and it's a little more 360 degree problem than defining skill sets only. And the final one would be that it says, you know, today and it, the business case on that for overall for people and countries is right there. So you have to make sure that there is a significant investment because that reduces imports in a large way as we start to go together. So these would be four kind of areas that we see or I see personally as key drivers to drive the challenges that one faces in driving R&D. Uh, so you, are, you actually laid it very well in terms of skill gap. You talked about um, uh, the alignment between the ROI on R&D investments uh, to the motivations of research institutions and how could you really bring these pieces together. Um, you also talked about um, looking at indigenous solutions, uh, solutions that are really invented locally to solve specific problems locally. So, um, I mean, for example, maybe um, Venkat, from your experience, are there uh, ways where you've seen overcoming some of these barriers that you had? You talked about collaboration with, I mean, you had some great examples at the beginning of the uh, uh, of this discussion around the collaboration that you had with uh, research institutes, with uh, Microsoft Research, as well as with real um, customers to solve concrete problems. What were some of the barriers that you faced and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Actually, let me sort of maybe uh, broaden the question a little bit and uh, you know provide a somewhat different perspective when i look at it globally right I, I, uh, certainly uh, with microsoft research interactions with top universities across the world uh, our goal is not to turn the universities into something like industry so, so what i mean is you know it's good for you know you look at you know top places like you know berkeley where i got my phd or stanford or mit you know they are obviously uh, quite aware of the latest happening in industry, the, the state of technology and so on. But they don't let industry dictate what they do. Rather, they invent the future. And in some sense, new industries come out of the university research, right? Uh, so in some sense, uh, we have followed the same model here as well. Like, you know, when we work with academia from Microsoft Research India uh, and like with, you know, IITs and, uh, you know, triple IITs and others, it is as, uh, uh, sort of an open-ended research project. It is not a contract where we say, okay, you know, this is something specific we need for a customer, do it for us. It is more a joint exploration. Well, let's get together and explore an area and mm -hmm. anything will be open, it will be in the public domain, right? Any any collaboration we do uh, is in the public domain. So that's the model we have followed. Uh, now, if someone in academia wants to have more direct impact on uh, uh, industry or uh, like in the case of Microsoft on something that Microsoft is building, then I think the best way of doing that is for them to come in as a consultant or a visiting researcher or if it's a student as an intern, spend some time with us and work you know, shoulder to shoulder with people at Microsoft and make that happen. And we certainly have examples of that as well. But when we collaborate with the university, we tend to keep it, uh, you know, uh, quite open. So in that sense, uh, yeah, we don't, uh, you know, uh, as I said, we don't try to sort of 
make the university group an extension of the of the company uh, if, if i may have can i just uh, add something very quickly to the previous question because uh, uh, you know there again we have something that is uh, perhaps unique uh, but it is something interesting we have done as lab at maxwell research as i said we, we do projects that are inspired by the uh, indian setting and you know things that are at our doorstep and in some cases those are interesting very interesting things that we do but there isn't an outlet in microsoft there isn't a microsoft product or service that is a natural home for that so in those cases, what we've done is we have spun off those things as companies. So essentially, we have created startups out of our lab, which is not very common for a large company to do. But we have at least two or three such examples. You know, in the health, the 99 dots I mentioned uh, became a company called Everwell. A couple of our employees went and they formed this company without blessings. So it was done sort of in a way that well, Microsoft uh, uh, was uh, happy to enable that. We have done that in digital agriculture. We have done that, or we are doing that in the case of uh, crowdsource work and so on, right? So, uh, you know, th there are cases where you have an interesting idea, there's huge potential, but doing it through Microsoft is not the best way of scaling it. We enable you to sort of uh, do a startup yourself, right? So, so we have had uh, that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, really valuable. Um, I want to actually ask um, uh, you, Bhavna, from the uh, experience of uh, uh, Hillard Packard on how do you see some of these challenges and barriers in your collaboration and how have you overcome it? I think uh, my thoughts are pretty similar to what also Venkat shared. Uh, these are some of the challenges that you know we, we also see. I think if, if you were to, uh, again, you know, I'm just taking a broader view here, Harsh, is that you know, if you were to have a little, little bit of a perseverance, Right to to get this going and and set the expectations right. You know, as I think Jagdish also talked about it because a lot of times uh, I, I know from the business side, uh, you know, you you tend to have a very very quick, uh, you know, expectations in terms of the end return, right? And you don't really see an immediate ROI, and hence when the expectations are misaligned, uh, and while you're working right with some of these folks externally, uh, it may run in to challenges, right? So I think first step is to get it right that, you know, set the internal expectations right and then take it forward. And I think also, you know, while we work with some of the other folks externally, it's also important to then, you know, keep in mind that, you know, what really we want to achieve, right? And be flexible, right? Mm -hmm. In that, because a lot of times when we have a very, let's say anybody for that matter has a very rigid mindset that, you know, this is exactly what we want. And we're not even ready to hear the other person's or the researcher's view, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to maybe have an open approach both ways mm -hmm. and have a more agile approach to uh, get where you want to reach. Uh, but if, if it's very, very specific, uh, I think, you know, you, you run into a lot more problems uh, compared to, you know, having a more nimble approach. I think both you, Bhavna, and also Venkat, you touched upon openness and an open collaborative approach rather than saying, hey, here is what we want to collaborate on to say, okay, what are the problems that we can jointly solve um, and have that openness in, uh, in, in the way you approach the, these collaborations. So that really stuck to me from this discussion. Um, and I also want to touch upon something very specific that you raised, Jagdish, in terms of skill gap and how do you really uh, bridge those skill gaps, right? So this is what we also try to do uh, at Springer Nature to make research openly available and you know make open access uh, the norm of uh, making all kinds of uh, advanced uh, research available to everybody. Um, so I want to come to you, uh, Jagdish, maybe to talk about the skill gap a little bit and how you see uh, bridging that from your experiences at Tech Mahindra. And I want to um, actually put the same question to you as well, Sachin, once uh, we have Jagdish's perspective. Uh, so you could sort of uh, think about it a little bit while Jagdish is uh, taking this question. So what I was saying is, I think the, you know, the skill gap is one such terminology that can, I think, apply to any any skill that we are talking about just by the sheer demand related with the skill that we have, right? And the quality of uh, requirements that we have for every skill as we start to look at it. There are only few ways that you think you can address this. And R&D is probably, and new tech is probably the toughest area to solve the problem. But it can be solved. And I think the way we look at it is a few models that other other organizations, other companies 
some of which Techim itself has applied or Tech Mahindra has applied. And I'd like to share that. One is create a, create a list of ecosystem players. Like for example, I said, um, we do work with Microsoft on some of the things, we work with some other companies on some of the things. How do you and the partner, in our case, the Alliance partners, whoever it is, could be a Google, could be an HP, could be a IBM, could be a ServiceNow, could be an SFDC, all those SaaS companies. You choose areas of work that you want to do with those guys. And what we've started in our own, own, own small way is to start creating our skill problems by a similar, similar setup, which allows people to do all the learning on the job. So one is for our internal guys, and second is for external guys. And we call it an education lanes initiative within the organization, where we allow people to come together and they get trained around on these skills and keep developing skill capability on it. But your organization also needs to be able to recognize the investment that people are doing. So how do you recognize that? How do you make sure that your policies encourage the conversation related to skill development? And how do you encourage this, that it is in the direction where you want the organization to go to? So our policies are there for change to allow people to take uh, certification programs, to take experiments. Our whole incubation setup is called a maker's lab. It's mm. basically innovation that makes things and not leaves it on paper. A, we are probably not the right guys to do paper type work. It's probably more the applications of it. So this skill development that we do then gets into every location of ours have a maker's lab, which is surrounded by the academic institution in that region. So Pune has its own setup. Germany has its own setup. Sydney has its own setup. Dallas has its own setup. So mm -hmm. has uh, Chandigarh. So the whole idea is that each of these then start to call in the startups in that area, the mm. uh, ecosystem of partners, and they they then work together in solving problems in this maker's lab. So I mm. think skill development can be solved if you solve practical problems that are customer related and you have a business end to it that is engaged. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it has a it has a very very um, it's a model that can easily become theoretical. So mm -hmm. the only way you solve that, according to according to me at least, is that you solve real life problems jointly with your operators and partners, and solve involve a client into it. And that I think gives you the biggest opportunity to create skills within mm -hmm. the organization and outside as well. That was a valuable perspective, and especially I love the idea of Makers Lab, um, which are centered in. Uh, um, different geographical locations and collaborating with the ecosystem around that place. Um, I want to actually come to you, Sachin, now, and we spoke about this last week as well when we talked about the session jointly, uh, specifically around some of the barriers that you see from your perspective. Um, and uh, also, if you have specific things on skill gap, that will also be valuable to share with our yeah. audience. Sure. No. Uh, see, there are two, two perspectives to this, right? Uh, what we have seen is that innovation is, let's say, creating the base for growth. But if I have to better position it and say growth led innovation, mm. you see a different mindset starting off, right? Mm -hmm. When you start looking at innovation, which is led from a lens of growth. So, for example, innovation within the genomic space or innovation within over the counter chip space or innovation within the way new labs are going to work, or the labs of the future in the healthcare space. You start looking at a very different lens of skill. You start looking at a very different lens of uh, application. You start seeing, and once we see the growth mindset being brought in, the skill rather than being the individual skill becomes a ecosystem skill. Uh, mm -hmm. Jagdish already mentioned this that all the various ecosystem players is important. But what I'll also add to that is the integration skill. The mm -hmm. difficult part in today's world, the barrier is I might have a great idea on genomics. Mm -hmm. I might have a great technology. But how do I bring these two together? How do I shape them? And then how do I keep, how do I know what is relevant for a particular business market or in geography or whatever it is? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that challenge is something which you have to stall through the whole data driven mindset and the growth driven mindset. Mm -hmm. And one of the key things we have realized is that 
gone are the days when a company or an organization can say we will do innovation by ourselves mm. innovation will be only created in an ecosystem will never be created in a vacuum and that is the nature of skill gaps we are seeing today and some of the problems you're solving and what we have taken uh, at markets and markets a very increasingly view with all our global clients is that put growth at the start and jatta position innovation within it see how you're actually going to grow various dimensions even when we talk to the universities we say look at innovation within the certain areas where you see the world is moving towards and then you become more and more relevant from day one and you keep people more interested in the innovation rather than getting disinterested over a period of time mm-hmm. Thanks a lot, Sachin. And as we come uh, towards the end, and I have one last favorite question of mine, I just want to uh, say that we touched upon really exciting things about, I mean, you also summed it up very well, that innovation and problem solving, that's what research and discovery is all about and application of technology is all about. And it doesn't happen in vacuum. It needs to be open. It needs to be collaborative. Um, and, uh, you know, we also talked about the barriers and challenges and how you gave very concrete examples from your everyday life and in your companies on how you overcame some of these challenges for problem solving. So it's really fascinating conversation so far. But my favorite question is all of us are technologists and uh, we, we are actually taking a peek look at what's coming ahead, all the impact of technologies like AI, ML, we're talking about artificial general intelligence, we're talking about other disruptive technologies like Web3, we're talking about quantum computing, uh, cryptography, we're talking about um, genomics, we're talking about advances in synthetic biology, and as technologists, all of this really, really fascinate us. So I want to get one example, one favorite technology, emerging technology that you believe will really disrupt certain industries. Um, and provide competitive edge to global technology uh, companies like yours, right? What would be that uh, one thing? And if you have an example, that will be valuable as well. And let's go in a, in, in in the round and maybe uh, Venkat, you can start with your favorite and your example. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's again an <laughs> interesting question. Easy to ask, but sort of hard to answer. Uh, <laughs> it's happening. Let me just pick an example of something that I think could be a game changer. Uh, uh, it is uh, low latency networking. So essentially, ability to connect uh, point A to point B on the ground with a very low latency network path. And, you know, things like the Leo constellation network that people are launching, like thousands of satellites in low Earth orbit, mm-hmm. providing global coverage. Uh, they're quite interesting because, first of all, they provide global coverage. So they provide coverage even where there is no infrastructure. And secondly, there is the promise uh, of low latency. It's not happened yet. And so what that means then is that, you know, uh, connect the internet really enabled uh, this sort of view that of globalization and sort of the world is flat and you, know, you could be sitting in Bangalore doing work for a, a client in Boston and, and so on, right? But that's certain kind of work. Now with a low latency, highly reliable network, you can now actually have someone sitting here, operate a piece of machinery that is physically 10,000 miles away. Right? Awesome. So, so, yeah, so, so Enable a new class. networking is your pick, and you explain what's the impact of that. So we're actually running uh, closer to the close of the session. Maybe I want to uh, give an opportunity uh, to everybody. One uh, technology they believe would be game changing. Uh, Bhavna, maybe with you next. What would that technology? Be? Very difficult to pick one. I think it's unfair <laughs> because I think there's so much. What's your favorite? <laughs> Well, I think my favorite, uh, besides a lot of other, I think it's also artificial intelligence because, you know, it has a wide range of uses, including streamlining job processes, aggregating a lot of data. And for example, you know, it's and, and it's very vast. For example, machine learning is one of the most common types of AI in development for business purposes and primarily used, right? I mean, you can process a very large amount of data very quickly. And you know, and those type of AIs, they, they appear to learn over time. So, or, or for, for example, deep learning, which is again, even more specific version of machine learning. So I think uh, it has very, very wide uses and it can become even more advanced uh, because it can help users, companies, businesses have a lot more customizable experience and really, you know, can be a good game changer. So I, I would put that. So you pick machine learning and deep learning specifically. 
30 seconds, Sachin, what's your favorite? Uh, I'm coming to you, Chakdesh. Is yeah, so mine will, be organ, uh, mine will be organ on a chip, uh, which is organ ability to diagnose, you know, human beings on a chip. That's very, very crucial for the future. <laughs> That's fascinating. Chakdesh, what's your take? 30 seconds. Well, quantum, I think. Quantum? The data that we are going to produce and the speed at which we need to compute in order to take a decision is only going to go up. Um, and we are producing data by the nanosecond. Um, unless we make meaning out of it, it's not going to be too good. So, you know, like Bhavna said, it's, it's, it's like choosing one of your children or one of your cousins. It's all of them are important. Um, but, uh, um, you know, if I had to pick one, it has to be probably quantum for me. Thank you. So you've been a fantastic panel today. Uh, thank you for all your insights and examples.